Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending June 2nd, 2018. And first up, some of you have seen on Facebook, people have been posting a picture of the camera that melted during the NASA SpaceX launch, and it looks to be a very expensive uh, Canon camera, I guess. So this is the actual story about it. Uh, some people are thinking that the exhaust blast from the spacecraft itself caused this camera to melt. Um, no, it actually melted from a secondary uh, brush fire that was near the camera. So anyway, the photographer that uh, was working on this was Bill Ingalls, the Space and Aeronautical Agency's photographer, and he is the one who tasked that he was tasked that day with capturing the launch. But even his 30 years of experience couldn't have stopped this from happening that fateful day. And if you scroll down in the middle of the page, you'll actually see. He, he was able to recover, fortunately, even though the camera was inoperable and uh, pretty much toast. He was able to recover the SD card and get the footage, and you can actually see parts of the camera melting over the front of the lens if you scroll down to the middle part. So, um, yeah, it ended up being from a brush fire. So He said uh, he'd set up six cameras, and he had six remotes, two outside the launch pad safety perimeter and four inside, which you would think, well, if one of the four inside was probably one of the ones that melted. No, it was actually one of the ones outside the perimeter that melted. And uh, if you scroll down even farther, you'll see a picture of all the different bushes around there. And they were extremely dry. Even though you can see some green in the picture, they're extremely dry. So they did catch on fire and ended up destroying his camera. But um, he said, uh, that's why we have the lovely GIF above offering firsthand look at the depth of the lone camera. RIP Bill Ingalls Cannon. We hardly knew you. So that's a little commentary the reporter made here. And so... Uh, uh, let's see, what's he going to do with it? It says he's going to, uh, it's not clearly exactly where the ruin camera is headed, but Ingalls suggested it will probably be put on display at NASA's headquarters in Washington, D.C. I kind of think myself, while it's really still in the news, uh, after it's displayed in the museum, probably put it on uh, eBay or something like that. He could probably get some pretty high bids for that camera. But, yeah, that's the real story beside the uh, be behind the camera that melted during the SpaceX launch at NASA. So, uh, uh, and according to him, it's his personal. I, I was always wondering, too, since he's the official photographer, maybe NASA paid for the equipment and that's NASA's equipment, but I guess it's own personal equipment he uses as part of what he does as a photographer for NASA. So pretty cool. As usual, all the links to all the articles you can check out down below. And next up, from Popular Science. Now, this is just, uh, this is nothing topical, but this is just something in general I was thinking about, and an article popped up, and it, uh, this is from Popular Science. Where does outer space start? Now, I know... Technically, people have just picked a point where the uh, atmosphere was very thin. I mean, it's not non-existent because it extends for quite a ways, but they just picked 100 kilometers or 62 miles high. Some people rounded to 60 miles high. And uh, what that is is actually that's called the Kármán line. And Theodor Kármán, uh, he determined he was a Hungarian physicist, and he determined that up at that height, um, yeah, the plane can't fly fast enough to generate lift. Or actually, it's almost equal. If you actually look at another video, I'm going to post below it, what happens is when you reach about 62 miles or so, about 100 kilometers, if you fly fast enough to get lift, just before you achieve lift, you actually fly fast enough to achieve orbit. So it's kind of a moot point about um, achieving lift or not because you've already reached enough uh, speed to achieve orbit. So uh, the other thing, too, is there's another um, kind of line that NASA has that uh, when you reach above 50 miles, control surfaces uh, no longer work on craft like that, too, and you have to use other means to be able to control aircraft. You still get some lift, but control surfaces just become inoperable, so you have to use something like um, rockets or little, I don't know what you would call them, little reaction jets or something like that underneath to uh, be able to um, change the direction, change the attitude of your aircraft. So they do award, when you get above 50 miles, they actually do award astronaut wings to... Uh, people that do that when you fly that high. So if you get a chance, check that out too. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll read a little bit of the article. While the Kármán line might be closest to official international designation of the beginning of space, it's by no means a standard for everyone. Interestingly, the U.S. signed the FAI agreement establishing 100 kilometers of the definition where space begins. It still awards NASA status, like I told you, up to uh, 50. And when you go above 50 miles, the altitude where the thermosphere begins and the temperature begins to rise with altitude. Um, there's also... Another definition, too, uh, they claim uh, that 73.3 miles high is a more accurate mark because uh, ions in what's left of the atmosphere move more calmly, and above it they move randomly and in a frenzy. So some people call it 73.3 miles. But interestingly enough, if the space station um, gets some drag, you know there's atmosphere left because the space station's like 
250 miles above the Earth, and they actually have to boost themselves up occasionally because the drag from the atmosphere actually tries to bring them down out of orbit. So you can't really say the atmosphere doesn't exist even at 250 miles, but that's the definition of outer space. And check out the video, too. The video is really interesting. The guy um, from Universe Today does a video about this. Now, next up, I'm going to end the TDD report right now as far as uh, my part, and I will catch you next week, but I'm going to finish up with about a four-minute video from Muzzle Mike. He's got his one-week review of the WISE camera and his likes and dislikes, and what I'm going to do, this is the short review he did for the TDD report. He does a longer review on his ITL, which uh, is up now. If you actually click on the link, you can go to the ITL, and he has a little bit more than nine minutes talking about it, too. So if you want a little more besides the four-minute review uh, he did for my channel, check out his channel and check out his ITL report. Every Saturday he puts the ITL report up. He runs about 20 minutes on his. I try to stay with mine under 10 minutes, so I keep mine a little shorter. He keeps his about 20 minutes or so. So check him out, and I will catch you next week. Hello, welcome to the TDD report. Yes, yet again, this is the, this is for Suburban Rider. You don't normally see me on the TDD report if he leaves us in. This will be number two, two in a row, that Muzzle Mike visits the TDD report. And to be honest with you, I do enjoy uh, helping Suburban Rider out. And I figure I'll go do this. Try to do a really quick brief. This is a first one week review review on the uh, on the Wise security camera, wireless the, the internet security camera. Really quick. Nothing's really changed. I got it mounted up on my front porch. I'll hug, grab it was just a temporary mount up. It's not really meant for out in the weather outside. They do make cases that you mount on the side of the house, whatever. And it look, to me, they look like little bird houses. But they do cover up the holes and stuff. So they did, they did listen to people and make the cases so you can use them out, outdoors. I've got it up underneath a roof, a, a protected area. Um, you can tell by the pictures and stuff. I'll take I'll, I'll snap, snapshots out and throw them in here. That way, whenever I'm, when I'm talking to you, you can see it. It's true 1080p. Um, it does wonderful. It actually does really wonderful. For a $20 camera, it is fantastic in my eyes. Some improvements could be done, though, with their services for their apps and stuff. The apps do work great on my devices. Uh, you can actually, whenever you're watching live, you can zoom in and get nice detail. That is where I think they can do improvement, though. Whenever that you get an, uh, get alert that you, there's a video motion video recorded for you, waiting for you to see it, and you go to view it, you can see the video. It does not let you zoom in to see detail, so you won't be able to see license plates, whatever, which kind of bothers me because I would like to be able to, to take, see my phone, if, if somebody, I don't know, breaks into my house, I like to take my phone and take it to the police and show it to them, hey, this is, a, this is the license plate, or look at this face, you can see the details. They could choose to print it out from there on in. But I like to be able to do it on my phone. Instead of having to download it onto a PC, then doing magic with my video, my video editing software. I should not, no, I shouldn't have to be able to do that. I should be able to show them in the raw form and, I, and, and zoom it in. I'd, uh, I prefer that. Um, I'm not using the audio alerts because it's outside from my house. I'm getting too much car noises. And no matter how far down I take it, either I have no audio alerts or I have a bunch of them because of the different noises out from my house. So no audio alerts. Video work, work alerts work great. Um, the two-way audio works fantastic. I've actually tried it out. It works fantastic. No complaints. I mean, um, I did have a very, very, very split second of uh, interruption, uh, interference with the camera. I think it was due to a car going bad by it was badly mistuned. I mean, it, it is, you're talking wireless and things can interfere with it like that and you have to understand it. If it's a very, very, very split second, that's acceptable in my eyes. But yeah, the camera is doing fantastic. I have no complaints. It is, I mean, it's 1080p, guys. You're, 10, you're getting true 1080p, and I mean, you're getting really, really good, clear images with it. And it, it's only between $20 and $30. Depends on where you get it. it you're doing great. It, it, my eyes would you like, would I, would I recommend it to somebody? At this point, being one week, yes. Um, I will be doing a uh, review 
at the beginning of every month on my channel, if Suburban Rider wants me to do it for you guys, it'll be a, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it for you guys too. It's not a problem. I'm going to do it for f uh, six months. We'll give it six months. I figure after six months, if it's rock solid, it's going to be rock solid for a while. I haven't had bad. I haven't had good luck with these internet wireless cameras in the past. That's why I'm doing it for six months. My other one died within a few months. So I mean that was a while back. It was a different brand name and everything else. But I figured you know let's do a follow up. Just a quick couple, maybe a minute, two minute follow up. Say hey, it's doing great so far. I'll kind of maybe throw a picture up or something. We'll, we'll try that out. We'll see what Suburban Rider would like to me to do. I'm more than willing to work work with him on this. I think this is fun working with each other. This is Muzzle Mike. Hope you all have a great week. Signing out.